So welcome to Hack the Real Size podcast with Heather, Ashley, and myself, Kira, where we like to talk to people from the entertainment industry with a little bit of cheeky banter and find out their personal journeys. And today, I am super excited, <laughs> ridiculously excited. For, because, very, for very bad reasons. No, for incredibly valid reasons. We have director, writer, producer, and environmental activist, MJ Bassett. Hello, now, MJ everybody. has done films like Death Watch, Solomon Kane, and my favorite ever TV show, <laughs> the third season of Strike Back. And if anyone is watching this who hasn't seen Strike Back, watch it because it is amazing. But there you go. It is season, that is seasons three, four, five, six, actually. Favorite one was yeah. season three, not gonna lie. So it's just, you know, season three and four. Is season three the one with Kamala? I can't remember what the seasons yeah, are. Yeah, so well, it, it te- on the internet it will say season three, and that's the one with Kamali. But technically, that's, that's, right. that, that's the best. I think I think that's the best season to be honest. That is the, that's the one I'm currently going over for the tenth time right now. But season I one, know. I guess technically was the one with Richard Armitage and Andrew Lincoln, which that was when was- it was still a UK, just a UK only show made by Sky yeah. TV, and that's I wasn't involved in that one. Okay. But all of the second season, I only came in on, on the third season, and then kind of took it over, took it for a ride for, I think I directed like 19 episodes and produced 30 of them or something. <sighs> Amazing. Yeah. Cool. Oh, well, we will talk um, about that later because I can't Okay, all right, sorry. About it. Um, so the way the podcast will work is Heather will start with off with some just silly quick fire questions just to loosen you up, just so we can get to know you a little bit more. Um, <laughs> and then Ashley will take the middle section, which is how you got started. Okay. And then I will take the last section, which will just be... Me flat out fangirl for half an hour. Uh, <laughs> good? This is this is. By the way, I've got to say this is very professionally thought through. I, I do a few of these things, and nobody has that kind of plan. Aww. And you said this like good list of stuff that you've done. Is that who's that Heather? Who's that? Um, <laughs> that I uh, me and Heather can be more meticulous, and Kira brings the fun. She is <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> she is the sunshine. Wild God, <laughs> I think you mean. Oh, okay. Because yeah, well, well, I mean, congrats, but well done. Because these things are not normally that well thought through. So you, I'm probably going to feel like, intimidated now because normally I just no, wing, wing, tell your I friends just wing about shit. Yeah, tell <laughs> you. <laughs> you can still totally wing it. We just have to be so like meticulous so we can it's, stay on point. Because okay. your attitude to life is to make shit up as you go along. So that's right. why they have well, to be. Well, if, if, so I will try not to derail your plans too no. wildly. No, derail them. Go for it. Yeah. Go okay. crazy. <laughs> All right, well, I, get, get on with the show then. All right, well, I will get started. So you can spend as much time on these questions and explain them as you want, or you can just spit them straight out. So are you ready okay. to get started? Let's do it. All right, first I feel, one. I feel like I'm on a game show. I need a buzzer. <laughs> oh my gosh, we should totally do something like in the future. Oh, with the real? Yeah. That's what we'll do. Okay. You can have that idea for free. <laughs> Thank you. We'll put contributed by. Please. <laughs> Credit. All right. First one. What movie can you watch over and over again without getting bored? Oh, there's a bunch of them. I mean, I just, I, my go to, I mean, there are certain go to movies like comfort movies. So Big Lebowski, anything by the Coen brothers, really, because they're always so rich in detail. You get something new out of them every time. Blade Runner, because it's my favorite movie of all time. Alien, because it's kind of the movie that got me interested in filmmaking in the first place. Um, there's some movies. Barry Levinson was one of my favorite directors in the kind of 80s, 90s, and he did a, a movie called Diner, which I can watch again and again. Uh, Bugsy is good. Generally speaking, for me, it's going to be whether the script is good. Mm. So it's like stuff which is, and also films that I can't make are very appealing to me. So I can't, you know, I, I know where I am in terms of being a filmmaker. I'm a very B list filmmaker, but you watch an A list filmmaker deliver what they're good at and you can just go oh my god every time they're rewarding so a good fincher movie david fincher right it's so meticulous and detailed so yeah but probably my my comfort movie is big lebowski ferris bueller's day off as well but yeah. oh that's a good one well yeah. what obstacle would you include in an ultimate obstacle course <laughs> um <laughs> in an ultimate well i mean like how ultimate we talk, we talk about life and death stuff Oh, whatever you want it to be, yeah. It could be a, it, would be, it would be one of those ones where, you know when you run across 
really quickly you go you have to and then the 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 wobbly platforms you run and if you slip you fall into the water right but that will be with some nile crocodiles in it i thought you're gonna go for sharks but that was still pretty no because i think is sharks are not as dangerous as crocodiles so you've exactly. thought you've thought this through very very quickly. That's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like for sure, like I because I well I've worked with shark and, sharks and crocodiles, and I'm not really scared of sharks, and I'm very frightened of crocodiles because they don't care. You are just meat to a crocodile. Mm -hmm. mm, true. I'm not what doing what sport would you require a mandatory amount of alcohol to be played? Sport. I don't play any sport do sport um well it could be Amanda. something like what who did what did one of our past guests say dressage oh know? yeah what yeah so which, which one do you think it would be funniest to add alcohol to to make oh i see to add alcohol to me like oh um mixed martial right, arts oh, oh that would be good. <laughs> i'll step in the i'll step in the arctic again drunk <laughs> oh my gosh that would be awesome what was the best or worst practical joke that you have played on someone or that someone has played on you? Practical jokes. I mean, like film sets are full of that crap, but it's like, what the, the best one, the worst one? Or you could just choose one of either or. I, well, hang on, I'm, I'm just trying to think of anything right now. Anything. We've been, so we've been locked down for like a, a year. I don't remember anything about my past life. Next, can't think of one, can't think of one. Next, next, sorry. I, know, I think in the future, we're all gonna be like pre-lockdown life and like during and post. I mean, it's, I find myself- Yeah, because, but, I, but I also have, like I have another stage, I have like pre-transition me and I don't really remember that person at all. So I have like 45 years of life, like I don't know what I did then. I was kind of like college. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I was drunk on testosterone for 45 years. Don't remember a damn thing. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, joke. No, can't remember. Can't think of anything. All right. Sorry. So this question we we like to ask most of our guests because we have gotten such really good responses. So if you could take any movie and remake it with Muppets, but have one human, what movie and what human? Silence of the Lambs. Oh, sorry. <laughs> with. I'm one human. Yeah. <laughs> does it does it have to be an, does it have to be an actor? Mm -mm. No, anybody. Just like any hum any human. Well, yeah. the, the film would probably work better if you put an actor in it, but if there's somebody you want to throw to the lambs, go for it. <laughs> no, no, no. But I would be like silence the lambs, but with Queen Elizabeth as Hannibal Lecter. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> But also, I quite fancy a Muppet lector. Mm. That's that, really... that has animal. But, but also, I but I think I think it should be Hannibal Lecter played by Doctor Bunsen Honeydew from the Muppets. Mm -hmm. You know, but don't, but you, see, you don't you can't ask a Muppet question and not know enough about the Muppets to fill the answer. That's terrible, <laughs> right? So. Bunsen, Dr. Bunsen, Honeydew, and Beaker are the scientists. Oh, yes, the, yes, yeah, yes, Beaker. The Beaker's the one that just goes, me, 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 Because I, th I think ordinarily you'd probably instinctively make Animal into Hannibal Lecter, but, but that's not funny because he's like, but I think like, yeah, Bunsen, Honeydew, or Sam the Eagle. See, he that's why you're the director. You thought outside the box. I did. Yeah, <laughs> it's because I don't know. I don't know where the box is. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long do you think you would realistically survive a zombie apocalypse? Oh, I, I no problem. Really? Yeah, oh, no problem. Everybody I, in zombie apocalypse, the people are assholes, right? Well, what have you got to avoid? You've got to avoid being bitten. So, just put on clothes that human teeth can't penetrate. It's not rocket science. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's like a red. I used to run when I was a teenager. I used to run for police dogs. You know when they train police dogs to bite criminals. So I put like the big arm pads on, and mm -hmm. like run and get bitten by a police dog. I can survive that shit. I can survive a zombie apocalypse. Also, I know how to shoot shit. So like it's like I can shoot shit, and I would dress appropriately. You watch the people in like The Walking Dead, and they're wearing t-shirts. Like are you a fucking moron. 
<laughs> they have to run. They have to be able to run. You can't run like if you're. Like, yes, you can. But you don't need to run, honey. You don't need to run. If there's a lot wearing... of them, you don't no, go still, There's a lot of them. You stay far away. There's that. There's the logic of keeping away from your enemy. But also, if you wear a suit that can't penetrate, what are they going to do? Wear your head. What? Wear a helmet. <laughs> Protected now. <laughs> Oh, oh my god well thank you for playing along with my little segment um, that's all right sorry i did i couldn't get the practical practical, question, practical joke question you i feel like i'm not like, a funny person now uh, no <laughs> you'll wake up in the middle of the night you'll be like damn it should have said this i'm gonna, I'm gonna add i'm gonna ask oh. for a reshoot <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can just like videotape so yourself and then send it in and we'll just seamlessly that's right splice it, it in oh yeah. you just you're just offering pick my up, energy yeah. services. That's right. If you, that's like a pickup shoot, right? Like when you miss something, go, oh, God, I have to go and sec get second unit to do a pickup shoot of my practical joke answer. You can do it. It's fine. I mean, my editing is not that amazing, but I can try. Right. What do you cut on? Uh, Premiere Pro. That's what I just cut my last movie on. So there you go. It works. Right. Yeah. Well, there you go. Now it's my part. I'm not as cheeky. So um, okay. we always like to start off where, where are you from? Simple as that. Oh, um, I'm from Shropshire in the UK, which is a county to the north of where Kira comes from. Awesome. And then what got you into, I know that you are a writer and a producer mm -hmm. and a director. So what got you into writing, producing and directing? Um, what got, got me into it, just like loving movies, wanting to be involved in the business. I, I was, I didn't, didn't want to be a filmmaker as a child. I wanted to be a, a vet. I mean, that's why I'm, wildlife and animals are my great passion. Um, the, the, the movie stuff only came about because in the teenage, in my teenage years, again, because I'm much older than you guys, was when video started. So in the UK, VHS and Betamax videos came out and suddenly movies that weren't available at all in the UK were suddenly available, right? I lived in this tiny little rural town where there was no cinema. So I never got, went to the movies apart from like once or twice a year. Um, so movies didn't impact me at all particularly. And then video stores started happening all over the UK. And suddenly there were like all these amazing American movies, particularly, ho particularly horror movies. And it's like, these are the coolest things ever. Can you make them? No. Okay. Wanted to be a vet. So that was definitely my pathway. And then when I was, I guess I left school at 15, 16, failed, failed at school. Um, the vet thing had to go out the window. I was running wildlife hospitals and doing talks on wildlife and natural history. And then I got called by a UK TV producer who wanted a young person to host wildlife programs as part of the children's TV shows in the UK. I, I, so I made enough money to buy a video camera and I started making films. And everyone says, oh, you're making films about animals. It's like, no, I want to blow shit up. So that was, a, so I managed to do get, get my love of natural history and my love of kind of actiony genre stuff sort of at the same time. And then the filmmaking I say it took off because it took me years to get a proper job, but I decided that's what I was going to concentrate on. So I kind of went in that way. Did, what was the question? How did you get into writing, producing and directing? But that's- Oh, well, I mean, you have to do well because you get, you get into it because you have no choice but to do it, right? That's, that's so- and then remember, this is in the days before, like, you know, now this, this is a movie studio all by itself, right? This, you can do anything you want. When I started, and this was, and I did a little bit on like Super 8 film, mm -hmm. partly because my older brother and his friends had a Super 8 camera. So I used to hang around with them and watch them do stuff. And to this day, I kind of credit my love of explosions with, Again, this in the UK, so it's different culture to the US and probably the rest of the world. Fireworks in the UK are very hard to get hold of, right? So once a year, we have fireworks night. And what we would do is we would gather up all the fireworks that weren't fully exploded and scrape out all the gunpowder that was left over to get a little pile of gunpowder and then fill a toy spaceship with the gunpowder and then film it exploding. And I remember this as a, I can't even more than like seven or eight years old, my older brother and his buddies and they lit this thing and it just went boof. And I remember thinking that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I sort of think I've been chasing that experience <laughs> ever since. 
So that kind of got me into the idea of filmmaking. And then I, then, and then I say I bought a video camera, but it was, there were old VHS tapes, which are terrible things. So what you had to do is you had to shoot the stuff you wanted, get a VHS player, put it in, then get another VHS player, connect the two things up and then like play and record. So you could edit in a kind of like play, pause, record, play, pause, record kind of way of doing it. But every time you recorded it, because it was analog, it would get like, like old tapes, it would get worse and worse quality. So by the time I'd finished my movie or my little short film, it was unwatchable garbage. So did you not just, just be, not just because it was bad? Pardon? I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you kind of just train yourself on just like how to create your own movies? You just yeah. started to do uh, it yourself. I'm, the one thing I did when I when I left school initially at 16, I went to work for a wildlife filmmaker who worked for BBC Bristol, where they make all these amazing wildlife documentaries. And he trained me as a stills photographer. Mm-hmm. And I did okay, I won some awards and, and was pretty good at that and, a little, and some filmmaking as well. So I had the basics of how to frame and shoot, but everything else I taught myself. Nice. So I've never been to film school or done any of that stuff. That's awesome. And, and, and some people making... would say, that's why you're a crap director, they'd say. No, I was gonna say, that's why you're out here making awesome movies. Like that's amazing. You're like, I'm Well, I'm a big believer in just doing and not talking about stuff. I, I, so I live in LA and like everybody just talks about stuff they're going to do. Mm-hmm. And I have no tolerance for that, partly because I'm English, I suppose, as well. It's like, just shut up and do it. Mm-hmm. Don't talk about it. Yeah. Right? And I, because it's like everybody talks. Everybody has a script they're going to write. Everyone has a book they're going to write. Everyone has a film they're going to make. Right. Because, and they wait until it's perfect. And it's like, it will never be perfect. Yeah. Do a shitty thing rather than nothing. Yeah. That's a perfect quote, too. We're using that one. Yeah. Write it, it down. down. It's true, though. Just do a shitty do thing. It. MJ Bowser says, do a shitty thing. No, it's perfect. <laughs> It's the perfect thing though, because like you said, if you're waiting for things to be perfect, nothing will mm-hmm. get done. Yeah, because you get par- you get a little bit paralyzed by trying to be perfect, like trying to get make your script perfect. And of course you want it to be, and you go in with all those ambitions, but the truth is it's not, everything is compromised. The only place it's ever pure is in your head. You know, mm-hmm. even even just something like, a, you know, before I'm talking to you guys, it's like I'm writing a screenplay at the moment and it's like, I can't think of the perfect word or the perfect phrase. I know exactly what something's going to look like or how somebody's going to perform something, but everything is a translation. So you're getting more and more diluted, unless you're, I don't know, James Cameron or Spielberg or Ridley Scott or somebody who has absolute power to just keep going back and doing it until they're happy with it. For me, you know, I know that I only have a certain amount of money, a certain amount of time and everything I do. And it's like, okay, that's as good as I'm going to get it today. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, as I get as I get more experience and better, I get each one is a little bit closer to that perfection. But it's still only my version of perfection. What I consider might be perfect. Everyone else might hate anyway. Right. So I've also kind of learned to stop chasing the audience because I don't think that, that gets you anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also, I guess you don't learn anything by just sitting and waiting. You learn by doing and making mistakes and getting feedback and stuff. Yeah, so- you only learn. Oh, you only learn by doing. I mean, like you can be... Can be or somebody can tell you what to do but until you've done it and put those pathways in your brain and have that muscle memory and an understanding of a structure I mean there's just nothing else to do right yeah well I was going to ask you about your process but you kind of just told us you just you you do I wing it you wing it no no <laughs> that's it wing it just do it <laughs> but the, the, what's the process of what the writing directing pre- I mean like there's so, there's has- so many variables so what has been your process of getting to like where you are now so back in the early years you said that you worked um for a wildlife hospital and rehabilitation place i had my own as a teenager i had my own okay so then what was your process of leaving there and and you did your own show about wildlife yeah okay so what was your process from there how did you move forward well, I'm um, so i made so while i was doing that and i was on tv and i realized i wasn't a very good tv host I was never going to be David Attenborough, um, who is my hero. Um, but I, but I, and I really like making movies and I just enjoyed that process. And I thought I'm going to be a film director. And of course, it's just, just not, and especially in the UK in the 80s and in the late 80s, there's, there was no business. There was no business for commercial filmmaking. I didn't want to make kind of socially aware Ken Loach, Mike Lee kind of movies. I have no, they, I, I want them to exist. I think they're amazing, but I have no tolerance for that. I want to tell my stories in the 
in the kind of structure of genre. So thriller, horror, fantasy, sci-fi. Well, those are the movies and books and comics that I loved growing up. So the process was figuring out how to write something, what a screenplay looked like. You know, it's just those whole things. Read a book. But, oh, that's what a screenplay is. I think I can do that. It's a horrible mess. That doesn't work. You do it again. That doesn't work. You do it again. Somebody goes, oh, that's pretty good. That's a good story. So you sell up. You know, I sold my first script, I think called The Unblinking Eye, to Working Title Films. Mm-hmm. And they, a big UK film company, they made Four Weddings and a Funeral and went on to become a hugely successful mini studio. They bought an idea of mine, a script of mine, this thing called The Unblinking Eye, which was a kind of dark thriller, twisted, big twist in it. And I thought, oh my God, this is going to be my first movie. And I got on their new writers program. So I was very excited. I was young. I was in my, I guess, 20s. I just got married, um, had a young family. So like, I got to make a living. I wasn't making any kind of living. Um, they bought this thing and then they gave it back to me and said, oh, another movie's coming out with that plot. I was like, yeah, you're done. Bye-bye. So, so then, I, then I ended up um, making behind the scenes documentaries for movies. So I'd made enough friends in the sort of filmmaking community. I never lived in London. I always lived in Shropshire. So it's a long way from the, from the business. But I used to go down a lot and try and meet people and write letters and beg, you know, begging letters, basically. Hey, I'm a young filmmaker. Will you give me a break? Almost nobody could because they're all struggling as well. What they don't tell you is like everybody's desperate for their own work. It's not that people are mean. It's just like, unless you're really successful, you're looking for the next job yourself and you don't want to give somebody else a leg up. So I and a friend, a guy who became a friend of mine, two, two young filmmakers said, we can't give you a job as a, I wanted second unit directing, right? We can't give you second unit directing because we can't afford one ourselves, but we do need a behind the scenes documentary because it's part of our, promotional requirements, they were called EPKs, electronic press kits. And I said, well, what the hell is an EPK? And they explained, yeah, you've got to do interview all the actors and the director and make a little documentary about how we make the movie and shoot all the behind the scenes stuff. Now that's completely familiar now, everybody does those things. But back then they were just kind of beginning to be a standard part of the package. So I got my video camera and I used to go to film sets and I did about, I guess, 25 of these things. And I used to interview directors and actors and they all hated me because nobody wants to do the EPK. Nobody wants to be interviewed. I would wait around. I was like, do you have time to do? No, oh, okay. Do you have time to do? Oh, no, okay. How about, no, 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 oh, okay. Right? And then, but finally I would sit down and I'd do the, do the interview. And I would always ask directors, say, I want to be a director as well. Do you have some advice for me? So I'd collect all their bits of advice, you know, and then everyone has a different opinion, but certain bits of advice were always recurring. It's like, okay, I'm definitely gonna do that one. And some actors were really nice to me and I employ those actors today because they were nice to me then, right? So the lesson is be nice to everybody on the film set because you never know where they're going to end up. Right. Um, So that was, and then then, so while I was doing that, I wrote, kept writing scripts. And then finally um, I wrote Death Watch, which was called No Man's Land. And it was a horror movie set in the trenches of World War I. And it was supposed to be a super low budget movie because it you know, set in the trenches of World War I, so it was just like nine guys in a hole in the ground. So I thought that's as simple as it can be, but the, but the war was such a horrific thing of itself. I thought I could make a movie that was literally about the horror of war, but be wrapped up in a horror movie sort of genre thing. And I was really lucky. I got Jamie Bell, who at the time was just 15 years old. He'd just come off doing Billy Elliot. So he was like the biggest young star in the world at the time, he'd just beaten Russell Crowe for a BAFTA, which is like the British Academy Award. And I got my script out. And so in actual fact, I wrote this script and like 10 companies wanted to buy it. It's like, oh my God, I can sell this script. I can pay my mortgage. I can feed my kid. I mean, literally it was that desperate. And, but none of them wanted me as a director. So I was I was like, I, you know, I got to bet on myself. And my, my, my wife, my partner said, you know, sell it and I was like but I'll never get a chance to direct you can only get to direct your own stuff and she's like okay I trust you bet on yourself so I said to all these companies I want to direct it and eight of the nine said oh we don't want it then and it was like oh I've really fucked up I don't know what to do and I was just coming to my thing I think my 30th birthday and I was like okay I can't make a living at this and then the, the ninth company came back and said all right we're going to give you enough money to shoot a scene from your movie and just shoot a scene. Uh, and if we like it, we'll give you the job directing it as well. So I got a, I went to my local farmer 
in Shropshire and said, can I dig a World War I trench in your field? And so I did, I hired a digger and I spent like a week just digging this trench out and I got in ammunition boxes from a local military base and barbed one and made it look a World War I trench and I cast it and with mostly unknown actors. Um, but one of the unknown actors was James McAvoy. Wow. <laughs> fresh out of drama, 17 years old, fresh out of drama school. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, so got these young, I spent a weekend just shooting this scene from the movie, cut it, sent it to the finances and they said, all right, you're on. And, you know, then, and then one of the finances knew um, Jamie Bell and said, Jamie's interested and it was an ensemble. So Jamie's interested, will you, you know, you go meet him. And Jamie was like, I'm not sure about this. And he was a, lo a lovely young man, but he was like a big star. And he was, we, he, the place he was staying had tennis courts. And I said, tell you what, um, and he was playing tennis. Said, I'll play your game of tennis. And if I beat you, you'd be in my movie. Oh. So I beat the shit out of Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> he was really good. But, but I play, I played for my county. So I was deterred and I needed, Bye. I needed him. <laughs> and so the, and the movie had a really good car. I got Jamie Bell, I got Andy Serkis, who'd just come off Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. right? So nobody has seen Lord of the Rings, so he wasn't a big star, but he's a very well-known actor. I got Matthew Reese, who's gone on to be a really, really good actor as well. So a really good cast of, of British actors. Made that movie and, uh, you know, I'm not saying it was plain sailing, because after that film, it went really quiet for a while. Because mm -hmm. what nobody tells you is that your first movie is easier to get than your second movie. Really? Yeah, because particularly unless you have a big hit, right? So Death Watch was a quite well-regarded, mm. modestly successful film. Mm -hmm. And to this day, and it, what it did do, it started a kind of genre of war horror movies, which nobody had really done before. Yeah. Apart from Michael Mann. Michael Mann made a movie called The Keep, which was the first of those. But, so, but I did 10 years later, I did Death Watch. And then there was a whole glut of these things. So Death Watch did okay, but not well enough to make me a big name. Um, so I was back to kind of hustling. But now the trouble was people would say, what have you done? And I go, well, I've made Death Watch and they would watch the movie. So they actually had proof as to whether I was a good filmmaker or not. And if they didn't like the film, it's like, well, you're no good. So fuck off, right? Because <laughs> but as a first time filmmaker, you, you have all the promise. Mm -hmm. So if you pitch yourself really well, it's like I got I've got this vision in my storyboards and my art, they don't know that you're going to fuck it up, right? If you've made a movie, they know whether you're going to fuck it up or not. <laughs> so, so then I made, so then I made, I made Death Watch, and then I made a, a little horror movie called Wilderness, mm -hmm. which was a, sort of two or three years later. Which was, it's a fun. A lot of people like it, and um, but it's just a bare bones sort of slasher picture. And then after that, I made Solomon Kane, which is it's still my favorite film that I've made because it's, it's a big fantasy that. movie, and, and that's what I've always wanted to do. So there you go. What was the question? I don't even, I don't even What was my process? My process. Yeah, your process I gave you, my you asked my process and I gave you biography. I'm no, sorry. but I loved that. I loved all of that because it answered probably other questions that we had as well. Um, you talk about pitching and I just want to know from a technical, like how do you get yourself together to pitch your ideas? When you say get yourself together, what do you mean? Like you're, you said you got your uh, storyboards. Um, you what get your, oh, okay, I got you. So your it, pitch you're going to give. It it, it sort of depends what you're doing, right? So if you're a, a writer director like I was, you write your own script and you want to, somebody to buy that script or option the script with a view to financing the whole movie for you to direct, right? So obviously making any movie these days, even a low budget movie is a multi-million dollar endeavor and people just don't give that stuff away for nothing. They need some proof that you can not only make the film, but you can deliver it on time, on schedule and on budget because it's still a business. Mm -hmm. So that all the creative stuff that everybody talks about, absolutely, that's, a, that's a, the fundamental of what we do. But the truth of the matter is nobody wants to lose money and almost all movies lose money. Right? They, they, it's, a, it's a terror. It's, it's like they say, say what, what is it? They say, how do you make $100 million in a movie? Start, you know, 10, start with, oh, so, so how, how do you make, how do you lose $100 million? Start with $10 million. That's how you do it. It's like it always, always loses money until you have one big hit and that pays for all the other stuff. Um, so for me, when I'm pitching, if it's, if it's a straight screenplay, it's like I'll just write the screenplay and then try and sell it. No, nobody wants it. There you go. You, you wasted your time. If it's a movie I'm trying, to, I'm trying to pitch to get made, 
I need to prove to finances that it's a, it's a viable commercial entity in some capacity. So they can read the script. And if they like the script enough, they'll say, okay, come talk to us about how you would do this. And this, the first question is, who will be in this movie? Mm-hmm. So it's a business driven by actors. So if I'm financing a movie independently, there's not through this, not, I don't work through the studio system. Studio system is just, here's a bunch of money, go make a movie. I don't ever get to do that. I'm like, I have to build my finances out of little pots of money from all over the world. So I'll say, who's in the movie? And I'll say, this actor, they go, nah, they're, not, they're good, but they're not worth anything. They're not going to get people to come and pay for the film. And it just becomes a game, it's a game of numbers, right? This actor is worth this, and this actor is worth this together. They're worth this. And of course, nobody knows what anybody's really worth because they don't meet, doesn't, nobody definitely goes to see a movie. What movie star in the world guarantees people seeing a film these days? Nobody, even Brad Pitt makes dogs that nobody sees. Mm-hmm. So you have to kind of be sensitive. So you go, okay, I can make this movie for this amount of money with these actors. It slots into this genre, which is a little bit like these other movies, which made this amount of money, but mine is going to be different, but it's going to be similar, but different. It's like it's all these watchwords you have to say. So that's, there's that, that, that version of pitching. When you pitch to make a TV show, which is what I also do, mm-hmm. then you go into a room full of like, you know, 20 executives and they say, tell us about your show. And then you go, okay, well, it's a story of this mm-hmm. and it's the pilot episode. This is the story here and this is where it's going to go. So you basically have to be able to be, you know, happy, but it helps to be somebody who can be a bit of a performing seal, mm-hmm. you know, and be articulate and engaging in the room and be able to feel when the attention is drifting, mm-hmm. you know, and you go, okay, I'm losing them. What can I say to get them back? Is And, and then even then you have to remember that all day, every day of their lives, people are coming in to pitch shows to executives, yeah. right? So you think you're your original. No, they've got 10 of those ideas. So what's the appealing thing? And, you know, me, I'm, a, I'm an indifferently successful filmmaker. Some people know me, some people don't. Some people like my stuff, other people don't. You know, it's like, so I don't walk into a room and they go, oh, MJ's here, what have you got? I have to, I have to, I mean, the doors will be open for me to go through them, but nobody's, willing me to succeed I still have to make my own success awesome that yeah that's great all that information yeah. is amazing it's not uh, I mean it's no fun well I mean I like pitching I like going into rooms and meeting people mm-hmm. but it's it's pretty grinding and and the other thing is that when you have a project kind of ready you do a bunch of these pitches over like a week of doing four of these a day mm-hmm. So you go like, oh, 10 o'clock, I'm at Netflix, 11.20, I'm at Amazon. Then you got to drive across town. you got to go to Epics. And then you got to go to and see Showtime. And then you got to go, you know, and then so every single one is the same thing. Hey, how was your day? How, did you find the parking okay? Yeah, yeah. What have you been up to? Yeah, how, the lockdown's been terrible. Yeah. So five minutes of that. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you know somebody. It's like, oh, how are the kids? And then they go, so what have you got for us? And you go, let me tell you about this. Right? And it's just that's the way into it. Or you, or you try and pitch in a personal way. Goes, you know, you know what's really been bugging me recently? This, which gave me the idea to make a show about this. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you can do a pitch which doesn't feel like a pitch, that's even better. Yeah. Right. And then some people go, "Have you got anything for us?" You go, "Yeah, yeah. I put all this. I put a lookbook together. They call it a deck over here, which can be like a series of images. So it's going to look a little bit like this. And then you go, "Do you want to leave that behind?" And some agents like don't leave anything behind because then they can look at it and decide whether they like it or not, mm-hmm. right? Or you can go, you can have a little look at it and then we're gonna close it again. If you want it, you gotta pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, there's all these things. I'm not, a, you know, I'm no, I'm definitely not very successful. I'm definitely not an expert on this, but that's just my experience. So how do you deal with it if they don't want it then? Because we always say as an actor, you have to go in there, do the audition. Your job is not to get the job. Your job is to do the work, do your audition to the best of your abilities. It's out of your hands, walk away and don't think about it. But when you're pitching an idea, like that's part of you, you're giving up. And when they say no, how do you deal with that sort of rejection? You just walk, you get on with it. It's like life, right? You just suck it up. I, and get, I, I get rejected in every aspect of my life all the time. <laughs> um yeah you just it is it's it's hard because like with an audition i mean actors work very hard for their auditions of course they they prepare they have a couple of pages to learn everything you're pitching for a uh for a tv show you've maybe spent months and months on this thing yeah i'm like i'm doing something right now spending days full character stories the the plot for three seasons for 30 hours of television you're figuring it out right you have everything 
you, you should be able to answer any question about this, how I'm going to shoot it, what camera I'm going to use, lenses. I mean, everything I should know. My God. And then they could just go, yeah, that's no, really good, but we're not looking for that right now. Right? Or it's a little bit similar to what we've got. Or, you know, oh, you know, Sally just came in and pitched something really similar. We're going to go with hers. Right? And then sometimes, sometimes you think it's a slam dunk. You go, this is, of course you're going to make this. Nope. Yeah, we just spent all the money for this year. We're not commissioning anymore. Can you come back next year when the books are open again? It's just that. We, and one of the reasons why more and more stuff is, is not original, but based on other IP. Uh, IP is intellectual property, right? So comics or books or, some, or a remake of something is because there's a comfort in that for people. If you're going to spend $100 million on a TV show, it's like, okay, why do you think there's so many Walking Dead spinoffs? Mm -hmm. right? It's like, because, oh, let's, it's like, it makes sense. CSI spinoffs, let's do it in all these cities because people just want comfort because it's a business. The companies that own these studios are just giant corporations, right? And the studios for them mostly is just a very small part of their bottom line. Mm. So. That must be heartbreaking though. But like you said, ah. you just like, get up and move on. I mean, you do, what are you going to do? Like, don't That's be in the great business. That's way of looking you, at it though. Don't be in the business if you can't take it. Yeah. It's horrible. True, and also, yeah. but do other things which are satisfying for you creatively. If that's what you need, you cannot, I believe, anyway. And all, everything I'm saying is my opinion, by the way. Just I want to sort of, there should be a big thing along the bottom of the screen. This is just MJ's bullshit opinion, right? But <laughs> it's just have, have something else which fulfills you. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you're going to, it's going to kill you. It's uh, acting, acting is rejection, right? Which is why so many actors misbehave when they do finally get given power, right? Because all the time, basically an actor walks into a room saying, please employ me. You know, I'm giving you, I'm exposing my soul. I'm giving you everything. I just want a job. I want to pay my mortgage. I want to do this. I want to live a life. And 90% of the time is rejection. And then the kind of 10% they get a job. And the moment the camera turns, the actor is then given power, right? Because you can't fire an actor. Once, the, once you turn the camera over on an actor, Right. But they're also so rife with insecurities. Most actors are quite insecure about how they look, how they sound, you know, whether they're any good. So those you're juggling with very fragile egos and sensibilities as well. So it's hard. But acting is really hard. So one of my I have, I have finished. I love it. Acting's really hard. So good luck, girls. <laughs> So quit your day jobs yet, ladies. Uh, you know, let, let, me let me tell you something else. Is that the, the truth is there are not very many good actors. No. That is, that is the act. There are hundreds of thousands of actors and not very many good ones. Mm -hmm. Depending what your judgment of good is as well, by the way. I think but I, I, you know, hundreds of thousands yeah. part. <laughs> well, just go on IMDb and you can see where you are in the, in the like a, in the IMDb starometer. In the ratings. Yeah, did, did, did you see that? IMDb is like, and, and the, the other thing is now these days, is like, what's their ranking on IMDb? How many Instagram followers have actors got? You know, like, that's all, not for me as a director, but for studios and finances. It's like, oh, they've got a million and a half Instagram followers. That's, that's Clearly that's going to translate into box office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, but I can tell you right now, it doesn't. Vin Diesel's got a hundred million followers. And they don't watch his movies. Yeah, that's true. Well, someone keeps watching The Fast and the Furious. Don't know why, but someone does. They do. Oh, but it's not because of Vin Diesel. It's because the franchise itself is just is is the star. Mm -hmm. You know. That's so, true. but yeah, I mean, by the way, I like Vin Diesel stuff, but he, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. It really doesn't con tr um, translate, and somebody hasn't figured that out yet. So, my last question is one of my favorite shows is. Altered Carbon. You were a director on a couple episodes. Um, was. How was that process of doing that coming in on the second season? I really loved doing Altered Carbon because of the people. I mean, the show, I like the show a lot. I like sci-fi. So it was a big deal getting a, a gig on a nice, big, chunky, well-budgeted sci-fi mm -hmm. show. But for me, TV now, if, if I don't write, write the TV, if I'm not like a, one of the fundamental creators of it, being a TV director is essentially very, very different from any other kind of directing. You just get airlifted in, you do the job you're given. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's not, I mean, it's not, a, you know, I'm not just making widgets, but it is like, this is the show, it already exists. You don't have to cast it. 
you're not picking costumes, you're not designing, you're not writing it. So basically you're just managing the the shows. You, I did two episodes. You're managing the shows you're given. And within those, you're, you, you paint within the lines very, very specifically. Mm-hmm. Now, so the challenge creatively is, okay, I've been given my parameters. How can I make it me or feel like me? Now, when I'm brought in, generally it's because there's like an action component of the show or there's some sex there's some violence there's some action some capacity right i don't get brought in for doing relation stuff Mm -hmm. i get brought in somebody's getting their head kicked in right so that's and that's great i love it right so but but it also means that they sort of defer a little bit to my experience and my knowledge so there'll be a a scene and i'll go you know it might be better if we try this how about this this is a thing i've never done before that'd be fun with altered carbon it was it was really fabulous because a, t- a couple of the cast members I'd worked with before. So, the um, Leila Loren, who was one of the villain in the season two of Power, I directed her in Elder Carp, and I directed her in Power. So it was great. You walk through the door, and then she's like, "Oh my God, it's her friend!" And the guy who this is a, what an amazingly small world is. The the obscure German actor who was in Death Watch twenty years ago, um, Torben Liebrich ended up being cast as the head villain in Altered Carbon, right? So I walked through the door and it's like, didn't I crucify you on a field in the <laughs> Czech Republic 20 years ago? And there he was. So there was, that was wonderful already. The creative team's amazing. The writing was terrific. Um, and Anthony Mackie was an absolute joy to hang out with and, and, and be with. So I got lots and lots out of it. I have friends to this day from doing that show. Mm-hmm. you know now whether i would have done the done it differently if it had, i'd been completely in charge of it i you know of course i'd have done it kind of come at it slightly differently but no it's it's nice being involved in those big franchises and netflix are a great company to work for so yeah, yeah it's fine it's something i've always wondered is you do see on a series that guest directors come in and i've always thought why do they get each a new director every episode or every few episodes because surely that like you said you've got a, a theme to work to they've got a, a a template to already work to so you can't go completely out of your out of their remit you've got to stick to what is continuous throughout the series so so that's why is it so they bring different directors in because of what's happening in that particular episode what your skill set can bring to it there's a little bit of that but as much as anything is because tv is so massive right so it's six months of work sometimes eight months of work sometimes you know for these big long seasons no no one director well, it never used to be but no one director can do all of them Right. Mm-hmm. So even on a show like Strike Back that I know we're going to talk about in a bit, is that so I was the executive producer, the lead director, and you know, fundamentally the you know, the, one of the creative drivers of the whole thing, and I wrote some as well, is that no matter how desperately I wanted to, I couldn't physically direct all 10 episodes of a season. Right. So I would say I can manage two, then I'd probably and then I need a break to start prepping the middle two. And then another break to start re- prepping the last two. There's just, it's just impossible to do it because the machinery, because you've got basically got to be directing and then you're deciding on scripts for the next episodes. You've got to do design of the, of the locations and the sets and all the other things. You can't do it. So what you try and do is you go, I'll take the first two. We'll bring somebody else in for the, for the next two. Give me a break. I can prep because you're constantly leapfrogging each other. Mm-hmm. On some shows right now, more, more and more, and I like this a lot, and I haven't done it yet, but I like the idea of it, is they're, they're scheduling TV in a way that you can do all, generally the smaller runs, like they're sixes. It's like um, Karis Gogland, who's just done um, Falcon and Winter Soldier for Marvel, has done all six of them, okay. which is absolutely wonderful, right? And that way you get a continuity of director, you get a continuity with the cast, you can get a, a big movie feel to something because you know what you're doing all the way through. So I, I really, really like that. And certainly if i'm gonna do well the other thing by the way is sometimes you go i'll just do the first one and i'm gonna fuck off and do something else mm-hmm. right because there's a little bit of it like it's it can be a grind mm-hmm. months and months and months same people every day right and it's so it depends where you're headed at creatively a couple of things i'm working on now it's like oh i'd like to do all of those mm-hmm. but then a little bit of me is also like yeah but then i also like to go and do my little movies and I can't do that if I'm doing this. So sort of depends. And then if somebody offers you an absolute crap load of money, you'll do whatever they tell you. Yeah. At least you're honest. <laughs> yeah. Hasn't happened yet. 
So we've true. spoken a lot about Death Watch already, but that was one of my questions. So it right. was, well, like you said, almost 20 years ago, and it was very much sort of a joining of two genres, wasn't it? War and horror, and it was yeah. massive that it hadn't really been done before. Right. Um, I haven't seen it because I can't do horrors because I'm a pussy. But I have a wonderful friend called Marie. I'm shouting out to her because she gave me some uh, info on this one. She okay. said the trenches were just unbelievable. She said it's literally like you could have been there. It was so realistic and it was so different to anything else you'd seen at the time. How do you go about creating that sort of set? I mean, are you really heavily involved in that or do you just literally have set designers come in or I, I don't know all the technical terms. Well, you have to, I mean, does, but... obviously you have, I mean, yeah, the one, the thing about Death Watch is that it's, you haven't seen it, but it's not, not a bad movie actually. 20 years later, I can go, I would have done it completely differently, except that it's still not a bad film at all. Yeah. Um, so it's set in the trenches of World War One, and that's, and it completely cynically, when I was a young starting off, it's like, it's a hole in the ground. I can build a hole in the ground, right? Now it turns out the Germans, and it's set in a German trench, the Germans built incredibly elaborate trenches. The, U the UK and Allied forces built very basic trenches. The Germans built architectural masterpieces. <laughs> with multiple layers underground and the whole thing. So when I was researching that, so the whole thing about Death Watch came because when I was a little kid, my grandfather had a book called Covenants with Death, which was um, a book of photographs from the trenches. And mostly it's just dead soldiers in mud. And I was never allowed to look at this book, except I used to sneak on the shelves and, and pull it down. And those images really stayed with me. And I wanted to make something which was very authentic to that. So we went to the Czech Republic and myself and my production designer, a guy called Sally Denik, who is a Serbian, I believe. Um, we just, yeah, we literally dug a trench. And the idea was that the trench was supposed to be, when you saw it from the air, because it's evil, right? Was cut in like a, in a pentagram shape, a pentacle shape. But I, and I can never afford the big reveal aerial shot. So only I know <laughs> that my trench is one corner of a pointed star. Ah, uh, before um, drones. <laughs> before drones, right, before drones. And maybe that's why I'm so obsessed with drones now. It's like, I can get this <laughs> shot finally. Um, but yeah, so we, we literally just dug the trenches and it was the Czech winter, which is very, 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 very cold. Mm -hmm. Like a kind of, like a Midwest winter over here. Um, but yes, yeah, so, but I also wanted it to rain. So it rains in every scene in the movie. So I was bringing in 60,000 liters of water a day, raining it down onto a free, like minus 10 set, freezing, freezing set. And the, the water would freeze on the actors and just turn them into ice statues. They so must when have they would move, you. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, to this day, Andy Serkis says it's the hardest film he ever did. Wow. Right. But I've got this thing, we had to do a thing called a basic wet down because obviously the trenches were wet. So we'd have, get a fire hose and we just hose the actors down. And somewhere I've got a shot of my nine cast being hosed down in the freezing thing, singing Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it, I mean, it's very authentic. The movie itself is a bit wobbly, but the look is, is very strong. Wow, that's amazing. So we'll talk a little bit about Rogue because that's the that's the last one you had released, wasn't it? The last film you had. Rogue released. is the last one with Megan Fox, yeah. Yeah, so that was like a, a passion of environmental issues and action, your two favorite yep. things combining. So that must've been yes. really fun to it write. Was a, it was lovely to have a synthesis of those. Finally, I got to do two things. <laughs> Hopefully one of many to come. How did that one come about then? How did the synergy of your two passions merge? Um, well, that came about because of my, the, my producing partner, a lady called Molly Hassel, um, she said to me, oh, Lionsgate are looking to do some eco movies, low budget eco type movies. They all know that you're really into this stuff. Would you like to be an executive producer uh, on these movies? And we'll find some young filmmakers to kind of start up and I, because the budgets are very, very small. And my response was, I don't care about the budgets. I just want to do these things. So she said, well, what would you do? I said, oh, well, I got three ideas. So I pitched three ideas to the studio. I said, oh, well, I'll do one about lion farming. I want to do, excuse me, I want to do one about poaching and conservation. And then I want to do, want to do about the oceans and do sharks. And they were, and they were like, they all sound good, do those. So I went away wrote and these are very small budget movies just a couple of million dollars each and because it's the only way to keep control the more money you spend the more people you have to answer to so with with rogue the first one so i wrote this thing and i wanted to make a an action like an action movie 
but like a strike backy kind of thing for my comfort zone, but also have this underlying conservation message without it really being about the conservation. So like it's a perfectly entertaining action survival thriller that happens to have this underlying thing about it, which you can pay attention to if you want to or not. You know, there's no obligation to do it. Um, so I, I, I wrote this with my daughter. So then, so Isabel, who's or Izzy is my daughter, um, she's a really good writer. And I was working on something else. So I wrote, a, wrote the story outline, so a treatment it's called. I gave it to her and said, you want to just kick out a, a, what's called, I call it a vomit draft. So just write anything based on this. Just see how it feels. She wrote a vomit draft. I was like, oh, okay, this, I can see this is a movie. So then I took it back and I said, okay, now I'm going to do my version of this. Um, script turned out pretty good. Studio liked it. My producer said, yeah, we can get some money for this. Uh, we need to cast it. And so I ended up looking around and it had a strong, really strong female lead, uh, an ex-soldier. Uh, so I was looking for an actress who could embody that. And Megan Fox's name came up and I was like, yeah, no, not Megan Fox. That's a stupid idea. Uh, but the studio were like, oh, no, we really like this idea. She's a big star. And I thought, well, she's never done anything like this. So it's, it's a bit presumptuous of me to assume about an actor based just on movies I've seen them in. Right? And, that's, that, and that's a prejudice you've got to get over as a director or anybody. It's like, okay, you're in the headlines. You and, and the headlines make you look like this kind of person. But in reality, every actor I've ever met, even, if, are nothing like the headlines. They're just people. Right? And this shit happens around them and they're just trying to be who they are. Particularly actors, again, we talked about them being vulnerable and very open. So they kind of have this thrust upon them. So I went, we, we, sent, we did send it to Megan and she turned out she really liked it. And I was like, oh crap, am I gonna get Megan Fox in this movie? Uh, I met with her and she liked it. And okay, come to Africa for a few weeks and run around with a gun. I'll, I'll teach you how to be a soldier. So we did. That's brilliant. She did a pretty damn good job, actually, didn't she? Yeah, she she's pretty she's good, good, actually. She looked the part. I was impressed. I was impressed. I, I, talking of, I mean, she didn't, to be honest, we, we didn't, have, I was going to say, we didn't have a, she didn't have very long to train. So, and, and that's a shame because I think she could really shape up pretty strong. And even with what the time we did have with her, she, I think she delivered. And I think she surprised a lot of people. I mean, not like loads of people have seen the movie, but when you watch it, you know, initially there's like the, Megan Fox is a soldier? I don't think so. And you watch it and go, Actually, you know what? Yeah, why not? Yeah, it works. Uh, talking of casting, so did you make Philip Winchester audition or did you just phone him up and be like, Phil, I got a part. Did I make Philip the, uh, I think you're going to love. <laughs> Tell me you um, just phoned him up and he was like, yeah, why not? Yeah, so, yeah literally, it's, hey, Phil, do you want to come and play in Africa for a few weeks? He said, how much money have you got? I said, I haven't got anything. I said, just come down and hang out. He went, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best kind of friends to have. Best, best friends. I love Philip. He's a very, very good friend of mine. So, you know, you, I and, love you know, him I think too. you can tell him. That yeah, I, I bet him. you do. I bet you do. <laughs> he, I think he'd just come off like a TV show or something. So he, you know, been bunch, made a bunch of money and was very bored. And I said, you, we're going to go run around Africa. And, we, I, and obviously we shot a lot of strike back in Africa as well. So we really loved it. So I, I used a lot of my strike back crew and people who I met while I was over there. So I just called a lot of folks up and said, I'm doing this really cheap movie. We're gonna run around for two or three weeks, having fun. Do you wanna come and play? And it was really that. I, I like my movies to be playtime for everybody. That sounds amazing. I yeah, feel that yeah. he was very much um, channeling a bit of Damien Scott in that one. There was a few he, well, well, uh, he's, 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 here or there. That, that, yeah, you know, it's completely true. Joey could see Philip's really funny and he never has gets the chance to completely be that funny guy. Yeah. Um, so I thought I'd give him Joey Kaczynski, a kind of, you know, bisexual mercenary who's funny and hard. But I would like to make a movie about his character because I think oh, Joey yes, Kaczynski is a great too. character. Um, but I've just directed Philip in this new movie, Endangered Species, mm -hmm. where he plays just a, a an oil executive father to this family and he's actually not he's the bad guy really he's the morally compromised father who's distant and not great and kind of has to learn to be a good dad and there's no guns and there's not much running around that's it's gonna proper, be really I mean, interesting he's a good I mean Philip's a good actor Philip's a properly trained actor so it's not like it's a challenge for him he's just nobody sees him that way mm -hmm. so I, I said you know I called him during lockdown. I said, do you want to come to Kenya and make another movie? we got nothing else to do. So that's what we did. Why do my friends never phone me up and do say stuff like that? 
I, I, I need better you. friends. I need to level up. I called you and asked you if you wanted to be on a podcast. Oh yeah, that's true. Anything? Yeah. yeah, okay. Come on. We're Next low time. budget over here. God. You do there you go. Stuff. I finally got a blue curtain. Can you can you talk about your new movie a little bit more at all? Uh, yeah, so the new one coming out uh, in the US on May the 28th, mm -hmm. video on demand and other places where you get movies. Uh, so it's called Endangered Species. And it's the story of a wealthy American family who do their dream vacation to Kenya. And it doesn't go quite as they wanted it to go. So it's a kind of survival family adventure drama. It's the least, I'm not saying there's no action in it, but it's, 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 it's very character driven in terms of all the family have secrets. They all, it all gets kind of revealed and exposed in the course of trying to survive in Amboseli National Park once their vehicle has been destroyed by a rhino and they've got nowhere to go. So, and it's, it's fun. It's a good little, I've just delivered it last week. And I'm really pleased with it. It's again, it's a very small movie. So it's Philip Winchester, Rebecca Romaine, who was in the first X-Men movie. She was the blue one in mm -hmm. Mystique in, in the X-Men movies. Um, my daughter Izzy co-wrote it with me and she's in it again because she's cheap. Um, and uh, a couple of other young actors who play the rest of the other, the other boys in the family. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really pleased with it. And also Jerry O'Connell, who is um, Rebecca's that's husband, came along. Um, that's really so, nice. That yeah, awesome. so it's, I, I think it's good. I mean, nobody's seen it yet, so I, I don't know what the response is going to be, but it was certainly fun to do. And with that one, it was a lockdown movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did, I was basically, I was shooting a TV show in, in Hungary when the lockdown happened. I got, we all got sent home. I got stuck in the UK for a while and I couldn't get back to the US because all the borders were closed. And I had this script that we were going to do. And Molly called me, my, again, my, my producer said, we can't go to South Africa and make this movie. What should we do? And I was looking at basically a map of Africa and looking for countries that hadn't closed the borders. And Kenya, where I'd never been, uh, was still, you were still allowed to go there. So I was like, you know, you know, in Kenya, and it's like I can definitely do this movie in Kenya. Can they, can they make a movie like this? Can we do it? So we, Molly and I, we we thought we can do it. So we basically, I was in the UK, Molly was in the, in LA. We got on planes, went through all the COVID crap, landed in Kenya, met with a local production company, and said, "We want to make this movie. Can we do it?" They said yes. So we thought, right, so we stayed in Kenya and we just put the movie together, cast it. I called Philip Winchester and said, do you want to come to Kenya? All right. Um, he said, I want to bring my family. I said, no, nope, we can't afford it. Um, so we had to go through all the Kobe protocols, bring everybody in. And lots of people didn't want to travel, obviously, because it was the height of the pandemic. Uh, but those that did came along and it was very strange and wonderful being, and it was a very small crew, only a crew of about 25 people. So just a cast of sort of five principal actors, small crew. We created our bubble. We went to Amboseli and shot this movie in the shadow of Mount Kilimanjaro, which for me was this incredible lifetime ambition that happened because of COVID. We'd never have done it any other way. And the movie, I mean, even if, the, even if you think the movie's crap, it looks amazing because this place is extraordinary. You know, mm -hmm. the problem I had when I was shooting it was to not have elephants in the background of the shots. There are elephants everywhere, you know, giraffe and herds of zebra and wildebeest. Oh, look, there's a lion. Okay, we can't, you know, it's like, it's all that. It's amazing. That's a very interesting problem to have. Yeah, it's a crazy problem. I mean, it's my kind of problem. It's my perfect problem. Yes. Just like somebody going along shooing the elephant. Come on. I was going to say, do you ever need like a shoer of an elephant, you know? Let oh, me we know. Do. No, we, we had to have armed guards all the time. Yeah, because, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So right. we'd rock up at a location I'd, I'd be like, oh, I like this stop here and shoot something here. Because I did a very kind of loose and rock and roll kind of vibe. So we'd drive around the park with the camera crew in the van. We'd be driving and I'd go, oh, I like it here. Let's shoot theme 37 here. This is really, looks really good and the light's great. So the, the rangers would get out first. And there'd be four of them with, with, with guns. They would just make sure there was nothing dangerous in the area. Like if we're near a river, there'd be crocodile problems or hippos and the elephant that are not immediately dangerous, but they're so big and if you spook them, right? So only twice, I think, did they have to fire. They only fired blanks. They fired blanks in the air to just to scare some animals away. Um, but yeah, you know, it's like it's it's properly dangerous, and you got to be careful about snakes and things. Um, but I love it. 
So you'd literally just rock up and start filming because I just assumed that location managers weeks beforehand and you've set out exactly where every single film, every single scene was going to be filmed, but you literally would drive around and be like, I like this spot. Well, yeah, because I work in a slight, because the other thing is if you're the director and the producer, you can shoot in that particular way. No, nobody shoots in the way I've just described, right? Because you can't. But if you're, so with, with this, with, with endangered species, it would be like, I knew, we'd already scattered everywhere in the park. So like, we know there had to be a scene at the airport. So that's fine. There's a scene at the gates. We know those. So there's all, there's very specific things you had that we had to hit the lodge. But when it was like, okay, this is scenes of the family walking or the, you know, which sort of generic could be anywhere kind of, it would be like the light's really nice. And this is really good. And we had the whole park to play in. And so we really could do that. And sometimes, you know, you have to, yeah, the, the thing you've got to be aware of, you've got to make your days. As a director, nobody tells you this is rule number one, make your day. So you have a certain number of pages you have to shoot you got to do it and it can be like oh you can really indulge yourself and take a long time but you only have then you have no time at the end of the day so it all you know it's, it's really about managing time directing is managing time mm. as much as anything wow so talking about um just to go back to uh, rogue uh, briefly so when you're talking about sort of off the cuff things or as when yeah. up as you go along type thing in rogue you very nicely go from different genres so you go from action to like horror scene where they're being stalked or when they've got to fix yeah. the, the generator. Oh my God, I couldn't like watch the TV at that point. I was like, I feel like they're being stalked by something. Steal and then back- from Jurassic Park. That's what I'm yes, telling Yes, very much. Yes, very much Jurassic Park-esque. And then like there's drama and things like that. So obviously you create different uh, atmospheres based on what lenses and what the light in and with handheld camera or trolley camera and stuff. At what point are those yeah. decisions made? Is that something you have to prep for far in advance or is it a case of when you're there on the day, you know how you want it to look and you can just switch and change and see what works or? Mm, no, you, you do have to be, again, this so the contract, again, Rogue and, and Endangered Species are kind of cut from the same sort of cloth. Is that They're both relatively low budget they're both movies that I produce as well as write and direct. So, <clears throat> excuse me, there's there's an enormous amount of creative control and kind of everybody serves me. So I, my, my first AD will say, well, what, what do you plan for this scene? So you, I'm obviously spent days and days reading through the script, talking about scenes. And they'll be like, okay, this is a scene by the river. What do you want to have happen here? And I'm like, well, I'd like a drone, a drone because I want to be able to see from above. So you have to book the drone for the day. Or it's like, I think it should be a crane shot. And so, okay, can we get a crane to that location? So I know in my head, even though it sounds like I'm making it up, I'm not making anything up. I know exactly, exactly what I want the the scene to look like and be like going into it. The freedom you have, if you have actors that you trust and a crew who know how to work with you, is that you can say, you know, I think my idea actually sucks. What else are we going to, let's discover something new. And so the actors will say, well, yeah, but I thought we'd stand over here and do that. And I'm like, no, because my light's here and I like the cat. So sometimes you'll negotiate them back to where you want them to be. But sometimes you'll see something they're doing. Go, oh, my God, that's a much better idea. Let's now accommodate that and let's discover something. So I like to work that way on my stuff. When you're doing a, a TV show, for instance, and I've got a job coming up um, that's uh, a new Chris Pratt's new, t- new TV show. I think called The Terminal List, which will be on Amazon, I guess next year, I suppose, um, they're going to want to know exactly what I need. So they'll say, this scene, scene 35, and I'll say, well, I want to, we'll, we'll go location scout it. So this building I really like, um, I think it should be a steady cam shot. So my director of photography will go, okay, I'm going to light it from here or we'll shoot it at this time of day. So it becomes a much more of a communal, you know, every head of department has their expertise. So I'll be like, I want this building to look like this. I'd rather it was red rather than green. And the production designer will go, yeah, we can make that a good red. And so what you are as a director doing is you're basically the, the, the kind of conduit for everybody's ideas and the arbiter of what will and won't work. But above you in TV are, you know, the studio and the executive producers. And, you know, when you're working with, I guess, someone like Chris Pratt, who's a big star, he'll be like, well, I don't want to do that. To be fair, I haven't worked with him yet, so I don't know. But he's, you know, he's a guy who knows what he wants. I've spoken to him, and he's like, "Yeah, we want to do this." So I'll service their vision mm-hmm. as much as I can. So, but yeah, there's there must never, never, never be a time where you don't know what you want as a director. Well, going back to my EPK days, 
Mm. And when I was interviewing directors, I say, give me one piece of advice. And one of the biggest recurring pieces of advice was always have an opinion. Mm. Even if you even if you don't give a shit, you mustn't as a director, you must never say, I don't care. Right? Mm. So you make them as a costume designer may come up and say, What do you want these buttons to be on this blouse? And you go, and really you're going, I'm never gonna see them. It doesn't matter to me, right? But really you, should, you go go, I want them to be pearl with a thing and that because you know, you you have a vision for it and you know what you want, but and it does but you know it doesn't really matter. Or the uh, set director will say, What color do you want the door to be? And you go, I want it to be blue. Right? Mm. Now it's probably not gonna be in shot or be in shot for half a second or something. But so long as everybody knows and understands that we're working towards a common vision, yeah, that's what people need. Right? Mm. People do they need people need directing. Not that you're necessarily you know best, but if you don't, if somebody, a director who doesn't have a strong vision or a strong control, the production will very quickly spin out of control. Mm-hmm. You know? Because so people are the, doing their own thing and then, and then you don't wrangle it together. So that's, that's, well, that's my take on it anyway. On the basis of people giving opinions, as a director, do you like it when the actors turn around and have an opinion or give an idea of what they think the scene could play or does it completely depend on the cast you've got because I know that some directors are very much like this is my baby don't even tell me and some other directors are like no I really like it when I get feedback from the actors uh well it depends who the actor is right I mean mm-hmm. a, 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 like a day player coming in and just doing a podcast I don't really think I'd say it like this <laughs> like yeah it's the bar thank wedge. You. <laughs> just yeah but but what what's it what you do what you really really want for actors is know your damn lines Mm-hmm. Yeah. right that's it know your lines right because if you know your lines then you can play mm-hmm. so what i i mean i love actors improvising i love but I, they better do the first damn take the way i want them to do it or the way it's written mm-hmm. so we have one because also by the way you are contractually obliged to shoot the script mm-hmm. right that's it i mean that's just the rule you're in breach of contract if you don't say the words that are written down once you've got that once, you can then say, all right, well, let's play. Let's see. I like what you did there. Let's develop that a little bit. Or like with Jerry O'Connell, who's kind of a, a really good comic sensibility, I would say, oh, I like that. Just throw it here. Hold this stick. What does it happen if you hold a stick? What happens if you do that? And then you'd riff in this direction. You go, oh, that's a bit wet. No, let's not, let's, that's a bad idea. Let's not do that. Or great. That's really, so, okay. So then you go, give me a minute. I'm just going to write some new stuff. And let's try that. Some actors get terrified when you go off script and they've learned their lines. That's what they're there to do. They're not there to make shit up for you. Mm-hmm. Right? That's a writer's job. So it depends. And it also depends. It's all about personalities as well. So if you've got some act- actor or anybody who's always pushing to do something, which is kind of counter, I always try and accommodate people. It's like, yeah, we'll try one like that. But the bottom line is this, is that the actor's not in the edit. I'm in the edit. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I'm going to completely do what the hell I want with your performance anyway. Yeah. Now, in TV, I don't always get to do the editing. Sometimes the studio gets to do the editing. So they're going to do what the hell they want with my work. Right? So shit rolls downhill. Always. But you do get these interesting, but I'm looking, all I'm looking for is creative collaboration. The service is the thing. So a little bit of also, this is a horrible thing. Directing is manipulating. So I've just got to manipulate everybody into thinking it's all their idea to do exactly what I want. <laughs> it's like what we do with husbands. I was going to say, it's about being a parent or a partner, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's really, really what happens a lot is like, you know, you, you don't want an actor to, to stand in a certain place on the set. So you'll just move a piece of furniture to there. Or... <laughs> You know, a lot of actors like to lean on tables and things. So you just make sure there's lots of clutter they can't lean. It's little, silly little things like that. But I also love to say, just give me something for you. I've got it. I've got what I'm looking for now. Now have at it. Yeah, that's one thing I think we've had from the coaches at the AC, as they've said, um, prepare your lines, prep, 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 know your lines inside and out. But also after you've done it how you've decided you're going to do it and how it says in the yeah. script 
the next take, try something a little bit different, be the editor's best friend, give them new stuff to work with, give yes. them options to choose from. And I think that's a probably a very terrifying place as a, an actor, I guess, is to try and do something slightly different each time or let the scene surprise you, they like to say, don't they? Let the word surprise yes. you. But it's true, but it, it's completely true. The other thing is that just understand the concept of continuity. Mm-hmm. Glasses off, glasses on, glasses off, this way, this hand, you have them in this hand in this take and this hand. I can't cut that. If you're holding them here in one take and then you're doing them here in the other take, that's it. Can't cut those two takes together. Mm. Right? So there's the fundamental of, and, that, and that's the, I am always astonished how little young actors understand just the technique of being on camera. Mm-hmm. Right? There's so much emphasis on, you know, the truth of the moment, which is clearly what we're after. But it's no good you being in the truth of the moment if I can't use the damn shot, mm. right? Mm. The number of actors who will do, they've got a moment where they're thinking, right? So it's like, you're thinking. But what they'll do is they'll think like this. And I'm like, the camera is here. <laughs> think to the camera, right? Yeah, but that lens is your friend. That wants, it wants to take everything from you. It wants, this is why also you have to do very, very little acting as well. There's, Almost everybody overacts, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Don't, yeah. you don't need to do much at all. The camera's going to get in your eyes. It's going to get in your head. If you think it, the audience will feel it. And the other thing is context is everything. So I can cut to a shot and I don't know, I don't know how much, you know, in terms of um, film studies, you guys, I remember I'm not trained at all. So I picked it up along the way, but you can take a shot, two completely separate shots and which were never shot together but you put them together and they have a whole new meaning. Mm-hmm. And editing is going to do that anyway. So just be always be aware that the, I mean, ultimately the editor rewrites the script. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's it. And you can make a completely different movie out of it if, if you've got it right. So it's, a, it's an interesting series of challenges for, every, for everybody. Very, very hard to act. Really, really fucking hard. Well, I am now going to move on to my favourite subject. And I, I appreciate we've kept you talking for so long. You've been so, so gracious with your time. But I cannot. Do you not... really believe anybody's still listening to this shit, by the way? <laughs> yes, <laughs> they are. Absolutely. You don't understand. Really? We are so excited. that. Thank you, everybody, for still listening. That's what I'm <laughs> saying, right? That you are talking to us and giving us, like, all this... So much gold. Seriously, so much gold. Um, but, of course, it... Literally my favourite TV show in the entire world. It's Ash vs. Evil Dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we haven't talked about you've that yet. That. You, don't, you don't like horror. You've never seen that. <laughs> no, don't. Uh, Strike back. Okay, so one right. thing my husband and I, when we started watching it, we watched it, I think we watched, so technically, like I said, season two. So the first Scott and Stonebridge, so Project Dawn, that was the first our first introduction to Strike Back. And then eventually okay. we watched the one with um, Richard Armitage and Andrew Lincoln. But the thing well, they that- And they Strike call that Strike Back Origins in America. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, the biggest thing I think that struck us when we watched it was every single episode was like a film. There was so much yeah. explosion. The production value was so much higher than anything else we've been watching on British TV round about yeah. that point. It was just so big. What yes. do you think it is about that that made, do they just suddenly decide that Origins was so good and then they're just going to throw a shitload of money at it? Or was it just the right place at the right time? Or just, I mean, they wouldn't have known how amazing the cast were going to be, I guess, until they started shooting. No, it didn't work like that at all. What happened was that they made the first season, of, and this is pre-me, by the way. So they, they made the first season of Strike Back with Richard Armitage and Andrew Lincoln, who obviously went on to Walking Dead. Um, and that was it, it got canceled because Richard Armitage got The Hobbit, got the lead in The Hobbit movies. So he went away and they, because and Sky, because it was just a British Sky production. So it's it's classic, like, you know, low budget, good, good, but, you know, not great. Um, Richard got The Hobbit movies, so he went to that and they didn't exercise his option. So they couldn't hold him to the next season of Strike Back. So it was completely dead. But then what happened? In the US, uh, a company called Cinemax, which is a H- which is kind of HBO's naughty sibling channel that showed all the kind of boisy, sexy, sporty type stuff. Um, Carrie Anthelis, who was the executive at um, HBO and was running Cinemax, 
sort of saw strike back and thought, if we Americanize that a little bit, we can keep that brand going. So they kill, I think they kill Richard Armitage in the first yeah. epi- beginning Porter. of the first, yeah. yeah, John Porter gets killed. Yeah. It's very, oh, very sorry, good of Armitage. Alert. <laughs> yes. I think we're way past that, right? So he gets killed and it allows Michael Stonebridge and Damien Scott to come together. Now, and that's just, you know, the, the machinations of plots. Now, Dan Percival was the, geez, I think it was Dan. I think Dan Percival did the first season and Bill Eagles, I believe, was the lead director on the second season, first American season. So they kind of, they set the template. So Dan and Bill kind of set the template for that. And then I came along in season, what would be the second American season, um, just as a guest director, because I directed Philip Winchester in Solomon Kane. Mm -hmm. So Phil is, Phil plays the young sidekick to James Purefoy's lead character. And because I cast Philip in a horror movie that never got made when he was like 22. He came in and auditioned for me as a young guy and he was great and I loved him and we cast him and the movie fell apart. So when I was looking for a young actor for Solomon Cain, I kind of, I thought, oh, Philip's great and he looks good with a sword and he's a really nice guy. So I called him up and I didn't realize at the time Phil was like really hurting for work. So I kind of saved his ass and gave him a job. So, and then we stayed friends after that, just, you know, email, Christmas emails and what have you. I'd made a movie, uh, a Silent Hill movie, which is again, a horror movie, which you won't have seen, but it's a, not a very good film. And I kind of fucked it up. So I was in director jail. Nobody was giving me any work. And I hadn't done, I hadn't done any TV at that stage. I was talking to Philip and Philip had was in, was done the first season of Strike Back. And he said, I'm doing this show Strike Back. I said, yeah, I love it. If like, you know, it didn't exist, I'd have to invent it. It's my perfect show. And he said, well, you should come and direct one. I'm like, well, yeah, I love you, Phil, but you're an actor, you can't offer me a job. It has to come from the producers. But it turns out the producers, a guy called Andy Harris, whose company also makes The Crown, mm-hmm. um, Andy was a fan of Solomon Cain. So they called me and said, you really want to come and do TV? And I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm not doing any work at the moment. I'd love to come down. So I got invited to Africa, to Cape Town, South Africa, to shoot a couple of episodes as a guest director. And the show had had a few financial problems. It, it, things had gone wrong. So they were hurting for money. The scripts weren't working. They basically said, we have no script. You, we know that you're a kind of writer and a director as well. Can you sit down with these writers and come up with a plot for us for a couple of episodes? This was when Charles Dance was the villain. Yeah. Um. I can't, remember, I can't remember much more about it than that. But yeah, it was in Africa. Charles Dance was stealing nuclear warheads or something. Mm-hmm. Under I the wrote, guise of a charity. Yeah. That's, wow, you really do know the show. I um, really do. <laughs> I, so I directed episodes seven and eight, and I got to kill one of the principal characters, uh, Rashawn Stone, uh, in a very rainy yes. sequence. Oh, that was just heartbreaking. I didn't think it was going right. to So yeah, so no, and I wanted to shoot him because um, I wanted to make a mark. Did that. They loved it. They said, do you want to come back as lead director next year? And I'm like, I really had a good time making this. And then I basically said, okay, I came in as a producer as well. I said, okay, now I want to change gear for the whole show. I want it to be bigger. I want it to feel like a movie every week. Like is it, we're making James Bond every week now. Yeah. And, and it became, and I think some people don't, don't like what I did because I made it a little bit more just kind of brasher and a little bit bigger and more American. But those and people came idiot. away... So. The grit. Well, I mean, people like the grittiness of the first couple of seasons, and I just took a little bit of grittiness away. We still have to do all the sexy stuff, and you know, I got. On, I loved Philip, and I ended up getting on really well with Sullivan, who was a he's a handful as an actor, but he and I That's really it. struck up a good fr- a good friendship. And then everybody was lovely, you know. Michelle Luke's was terrific, and and um, uh, Rona was good. Mm. You know, there was all there was these interesting tensions. So there's really good tensions to work with as well between the cast. And then I just got to go around the world blowing shit up and doing car chases and gunfights. And it was ever. just that, it's the best, honestly, best, best TV job I've ever had. I loved it. So we did that for, I don't know how many seasons. Um, I was exec- became executive producer as well. Um, so I had lots and lots of control over it. And then we got canceled. We basically ran out of steam. You know, there's only so many times you can save the world. Because the thing about the strike back world is they have to be the best, worst soldiers in the world 
or the worst best songs <laughs> in the world because they can't succeed. If they succeed, the episodes are three minutes long. Yeah, right? true. So they've got to keep failing, but failing in heroic ways. They come up against it, though. I mean, you know. Well, that's the thing. You have to keep building enemies. North Korea. You've got, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Korea. So you've got Michelle Yeoh. We're incredibly lucky to get Michelle. To, yeah. It was her first ever TV show, so we got her, right? And then Sully, Sully was doing 300, so he kind of, like, was going to go off and do movies. And we all got a little, It's very tiring doing these shows, like six or eight months just mm -hmm. traveling constantly. Um, and I have my own personal thing going on as well. So we just kind of like, okay, this should be the final season. We got canceled. I went off and did other shows, Power and Evil Dead and what have you. Um, and then they asked us to come back. So we put the show back together with a new cast. And I did one season of that and felt I just, it's not for me anymore. So I stay friends with Phil and Sullivan. And then, um, so I keep working with Phil. And I'm trying to get Sully into stuff, but he's in Australia having a good time right now. So yeah. it's a good, it's a great fun show. I loved it. So who do you I think would win in a fight between Scott and Stonebridge? Scott and Stonebridge or Phil and Sully? Well, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It depends what kind of fighting it is, right? Well, so, yeah. Um, Scott, Scott was a brawler. Yes. Stonebridge, Stonebridge has is technique. clinical. Yeah. Right. Stonebridge is always more clinical, which is very much out of Phil and Sully. I mean, I've been in... I've been in real fights with Sullivan, so I know what he's like in a bar fight. Is he a brawler um, in real life as well? Yeah, yeah, he's got a, a has a a shorter fuse. Philip mm. is very tough. I mean, Philip trains with special forces soldiers all the time in Montana. Mm -hmm. So, in just in real world terms, Philip Winchester is the most militarily capable actor I've ever seen. Yes. Can I just I mean, can... have it on record that when he is doing his moving with a gun, like he's panther like that man just yeah. is so smooth when he does his yeah. stuff. And my husband's yeah. really, I, I mean, action and guns. I wanted to be a stunt person when I was younger. So the whole oh, okay, yeah. guns and blowing up shit and stuff. Oh, so my, so my bag. And same with my husband. Right. And we sit there and we watch it and we're just like, yep, yeah, the, the way they handle the guns, the way they move. And I don't think I've seen another actor that looks literally like you picked him out of the regiment and put him in a TV yeah. show the way he... Completely. So, I mean, obviously Sullivan's very, very good as well, but the character isn't meant to be as clinical and as um, precise yeah. as Stonebridge, but Stonebridge... That was always that was always Sully's excuse as well. It's like, yeah, no, I'm a little <laughs> looser than Phil. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah I don't right. have to be as good. <laughs> I don't have to be as good. I mean, like, it, it is technique. I mean, Phil, Phil is very precise mm -hmm. and his weapons handling is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. And I've worked with... We, you know, with real soldiers a lot, and they and they are like, yes, you know, Phil Winchester hooks a corner like nobody, right? He could really have operated. Yes. And, and, and the great thing is he works with a lot of military charities as well for veterans to help them. So he uses his skills and then his acting stuff as well mm -hmm. to help them kind of relate to the real world again after they've served. And he works with what's called Gold Star families, so kids who've lost their parents to conflicts as well. So he does a lot of really, really good stuff. So, I mean, I, I adore Philip. He's a, he's a fundamentally good human being. Mm. We were shooting in Bangkok during a military coup. Mm -hmm. So one street we were doing, and this is for the final Scott Stonebridge season, there's a, there's a scene, I remember the scene we did, Max Beasley, an English actor, yeah. kidnaps a girl and she's in the trunk of his car. And we were shooting in the markets of downtown Bangkok. And it's so chaotic out there. That is literally, I just have, so Max just kidnapped this girl and we had hidden cameras there. He's like, just kidnap the girl and let's see what happens. So we're running through the market and he's got this poor girl and she's screaming, right? And so people are just like, what the hell's going on here? And I remember hiding, pretending to be a tourist and thinking, I'm going to be like a hero tourist and try and save the girl. <laughs> and Max didn't, Max didn't know this. So I just like turn around and go, what are you doing? And, I grow, and Max just like pushes me into a, into a stall. Right. But we're but we're shoot, so we're shooting in Bangkok during a military coup. So on, we have a we're doing shootouts on our street, and in the next street there's real guns and tanks going down the streets. And our company, that our Sony, who is our parent company, sent all these like safety experts out. So like, how are you going to protect yourselves? How are you going to get out of the country? And I'm like, I'm surrounded by soldiers. This is the safest production in the world, mm -hmm. right? Like I got a dozen ex you know operators within twenty yards of me nothing's gonna happen oh, that must have been intense um, there's a lot of running in that scene oh, lots of running <laughs> love it 
Love it. So, um, final, final thought. Is there any advice that you can give a, um, somebody who wants to get into directing? It doesn't have to be a, a long piece of advice or something, something that's really worked for you. And from our point of view, um, and a lot of people that we know listen to this, the acting side, what do you, what sort of perfect advice would you give somebody who wants to get into the industry for, uh, as an actor? Um, let's start with the directing. Okay, this is, this is how you do, become a director. You get this and you make a movie with this. It's as simple as that. Your cell phone is a movie studio, right? Steven Soderbergh has made a feature movie on, a, on an iPhone, right? There is no excuse anymore, right? So if you have something to say and you have a script, there's no reason why you can't direct. The only difference between me and somebody with an iPhone making a movie is pay. Mm -hmm. That's it. I, I now get paid to do what I do. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, because I, because I dragged myself up and did it myself and bought a camera and just did it. I'm very much of the opinion. I don't, the reason you go to film school is because you get immersed in culture. You get to meet people who you be your contemporaries mm -hmm. and your peers who you will hopefully build your careers alongside. You get to use all the equipment for free. All oh, that's great. But the foundational starting point is there is no excuse. You can shoot something and you can show it to a global audience immediately on YouTube or whatever Vimeo or whatever platform you use. So I'm sorry. I just think if you want to be a director, go direct something. That's brilliant though. That's yeah. well, it goes yeah. back to I mean, I, I just, before. The, just do shit. Yeah. Just yeah. do shit. You know, it doesn't matter if it's shit, just do it. And the same, almost the same, right? Acting slightly harder because you have to be a, you have to be acting for somebody for a reason. So that's a little trickier, right? So, you know, I, I you know, the, the local theater companies, just to get stagecraft, just to get experience, you know, it's really, really, that's, that's a much, much harder one. And I've not been involved in that ground foundational element of, you know, just dragging yourself around. Don't, ex what I don't, what I, the one I would say is, don't be a star, don't expect to be a star. There's a big difference. People who want to get, people who want to be famous and want to be an actor, I don't, I'm not interested in you, mm -hmm. right? Your desire to be famous is an entirely different pathology that's got nothing to do with wanting to be an actor, mm -hmm. right? There's something about being, being an actor is, and again, it's, it's, a little, it's a little bit of, it doesn't matter who sees your work because you're doing it to do it. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So if you want to act, if you want to embody something, if you want to find a truth, if you want to speak words, those are, that's very different from, I want everyone to look at me. Mm-hmm. Everybody looking at you is a byproduct of being a good actor, yeah. right? And and I and I think the most, so. My advice really is to park your ego mm -hmm. and do the work. And the work is learning how to subsume yourself and use your skills. Learn how to use your voice, right? So many young actors, you listen to them speaking, they don't have any ability to use their voice. They don't have any resonance. They can't modulate, you know. I've just been rewatching Game of Thrones, and the and apart from the fact the last two seasons are pretty awful, the it's so interesting watching the older cast and the younger cast and their comparative skill sets, and just in terms of how they use their voices. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, voice coach. That's what I'm looking for, and learn how to focus, as well. Pay attention, listen. Yeah. I mean, it's all the shit you're going to be told by everybody, but really, really, it is. It's like listen to what the other actor is saying. Know your words so well that you don't need to worry about your words because then you can listen to what the other, the other character is saying to you and you will feel the right emotions. If you feel it and think it, it will be there. So that's beautiful though, because uh, everyone else we've had on so far has been an actor. So your, whilst your advice is on a very similar vein, it's so lovely to see it from the director's point of view because you're coming up with things that maybe they wouldn't have thought of. So it's perfect, thank you. Although you said you've not oh, yeah. done the acting side of it. It's, it's very, very thought provoking. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't do it for all the money in the world. <laughs> well, one thing yeah. I, like, I, don't, I don't like how I look like anyway. I'm not going to put myself on camera, for goodness sake. <laughs> well, one way we also like to um, wrap up too is, is guest choice. So if there is anything that you want to share, like I know you've got, you know, the um, endangered species when that's coming out or where to follow you, or if there was something you wanted to talk about and we didn't ask you, it's kind of your moment to... My, the thing I want to say is that fuck the movie, save the planet, <laughs> right? 
That's another quote. Thank you. Yeah, we'll put that this on is, there. Because it's, the point, the point of it is, is that this is all trivial, mm -hmm. right? Well, this, this is an ecosystem that is dying under our feet. And if you can contribute in some tiny way, I mean, you know, I, I litter pick, right? That's why I go out with my partner and we just pick up trash around the place because it's what you can do. So my thing is, you know, think globally, act locally, mm -hmm. do a tiny bit. Because if we all do a tiny bit, that's a huge bit, mm -hmm. right? Don't use palm oil. Stop using palm oil, right? Mm -hmm. And pick up your shit. Stop using so much plastic. Yeah. Plastic. yeah, just the shit across the board. Stop using plastic, low packaging stuff. I mean, we all know this. I mean, the thing is, we all, and in the West, we all know this, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no but excuse at all. Convenience, aren't we? We're terrible. We just totally, get... totally, totally be slightly more inconvenienced. And we're yes. all, by the way, I'm a hypocrite. I travel the world on a plane, right? So my carbon footprint's enormous. But you do your bits where you can, though. So it all, well, you, we all do. We all try That's to, right? So, doing what you can. Yeah. So that's what, I, that's what I really care about more. I love making movies. It's my great passion in life, but, you know, conservation. We've got kids. You've all got kids. Mm. You've got to give them something, right? Yeah, we want that to be a planet for them to enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Is there a charity or something that you are tied to or passionate about? Well, I, do, I mean, I, do, I give, I mean, there's a bunch of charities I give to, but I, I generally support the anti-poaching um, patrols. Okay. So the, it's like the International Anti-Poaching Federation, I think it's called. And they give money to a bunch of the rangers out there, mm -hmm. and mostly okay. in Africa, but around the world as well. So, I, I mean, so it doesn't matter what charity you give it to, as long as it's giving to some, some, someone useful. Yeah. Um, I, I like to give it to the men and women on the ground. There's, there's, there's three um, groups of rangers in, in Southern Africa who are all female rangers. Yes. The Akashing, yeah. yeah, the Akashinga in, um, in Zimbabwe. There's the Black Mambas in South Africa. And there's Team Lioness in Kenya. So I, you know, I try and give something to those guys. Yes, I did a, um, a running challenge last year for the uh, the female warriors in Ash Ashinga. Akashinga, yeah, the brave Ashinga, ones. Yeah, yes. those ones. Yeah, was amazing. It October, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was actually. Yeah. 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 Oh, good on good on you. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was one of the things when I was reading about um, Rogue that you purposely said that you did not make the movie about lions being like these menacing animals purpose no totally not yeah 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 they did they just she's doing and this is you have to watch the whole movie to realize why the lioness is doing what she's doing she's not an arbitrary killing machine mm -hmm. and also i got a little bit of pressure from my finances like, can't it be a male lion like with the mane and all this we can sell that and i'm like well the lionesses do all the hard work right they didn't yeah. they do almost all the hunting mm -hmm. and it was and the movie was about really about two lionesses in its kind of super cliche way um, and I wanted that. And, and even though the lion visual effects aren't very good in the movie, it's like, it's still, that's her job mm -hmm. to just be a primal element. So, yeah. And in the same way, when I finally do my shark movie, the sharks aren't going to be evil. They're, not, they're just going to do what they do. Mm -hmm. right? We happen to be in the, in their way. Mm -hmm. It's always people that are evil. It's people, people are evil. Animals just do what they do. Yeah. yeah. I love you're gonna be the crocodiles that want to eat you. <laughs> you. You always say it's like so low budget and I'm sure, cause I don't, I don't know the budgets but i thought the lions look great and well you're very kind i thought they were a bit ropey but they... <laughs> really well, have you seen the new wonder woman have you seen those special effects and that's a big budget i was like no, that, i mean that, that listen that that's that's true my, my budgets i i suspect and this could be wrong i suspect the catering budget for wonder woman was larger than my budget <laughs> time. the snack <laughs> table was huge there i hear <laughs> yeah you know, fresh shrimp every day. But yeah, no, listen, it's, it's what it is. You know, I, you, yeah. I would rather use ropey digital effects than put real animals under stress. Mm -hmm. You know, we had lions on the set for one day on Rogue because the farm, the, the range where we were shooting, those lions actually lived there. Mm -hmm. And actually my cottage was next to the lion pride. So I would hear them roaring every night. So we brought them, we brought them into those cages at the beginning for half a day. And then very quickly, it was like, yeah, I don't really like being here. Let's just send them back. So we sent them back and then everything was digital after that. Well, thank you so much for all your time today. You have been absolutely amazing. You've just given You're us very kind. so much to think about. And um, yeah, we'll probably have to end up releasing this in two parts, I think, because there's just so much we've talked about. And I don't just know. cut out the boring crap and then, then you'll be at 25 minutes. I don't think there was boring crap. The whole time I was like, oh, I know. Yeah, it's like 2.30 in the morning here and I'm still like... <laughs>
So there was. Oh my no god! Problem. It is. It's two. It's two thirty-three. I hope you don't have to get up tomorrow morning. Uh, I have two relatively young children. However, it was Super Saturday with the Six Nations Rugby today, and I kept the kids out of the way pretty much all day, so my husband could watch three back-to-back games. Oh, he, he owes you. So he that bitch owes me tomorrow. Time. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> tomorrow morning, I'll be like, nah. make him make him work for it. Yeah. <laughs> all right guys it was lovely it was lovely meeting you all and good mm-hmm. luck with everything and um thank, thank you for being interested a great all right guys bye bye everybody bye